the learning outcome says you must be able to evaluate the main financial needs of the retail consumer and apply suitable protection products where appropriate. Okay, so that's the overall requirement. And to do that, they're saying you must evaluate the consumer attitudes and behavior towards managing debt, budgeting, borrowing and house purchase, considering trends in health and morbidity, longevity and mortality, employment, product design, development, access to advice. Okay, so all of that now we're basically saying, look, we've got to be ready for protection wherever it is from whatever it is. So we really are dealing now with this business of uncertainty, huge uncertainty. We don't know what's facing us in life. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to have a heart attack, stroke, whatever. And we don't know how long we're going to live. Okay, so we've got to make estimates on those things. We've got to say, okay, so we've got a little bit of statistical data out there. Okay, we all know that the chance of us living to 150 is fairly remote. But the chance of us dying in our 20s also very remote. But then we've got some areas up there in the 60s and 70s and 80s, 90s, where it's becoming more certain. Okay, so we, we, can, we can have a look and see how most of the country are doing to give us some average numbers to make it sort of sensible financial planning. But effectively here, when we say protection, we're really saying, look, it's all very well saying we need to be protected from all those things, but can we afford to be? So it's this balance of getting the budget right, how much cash available to invest, protect, etc. Okay, so in other words, how much have we got at the end of the day, having paid for our mortgage and our supermarket bills and our fuel in our car, etc., now to pay for our ICES and our protection and our pensions, etc. That's the balancing act. That's what they're talking about here, about the budgeting. Okay, so that's the, the key the key cash flow analysis. And obviously you can't do that too far into the future because we just don't know what we're going to be earning in 20 years time. But we've got to be able to make some estimates. We do know what age morning, what age our children are, etc. And therefore when are they likely to go to university, get married, or whatever. Um, uh, and maybe they've already got children or whatever it might be. So we've got lots of different areas of protection to look into. <coughs> and therefore we've got to do it with, within the budget constraints. And always remember that the regulator is going to be keen on you prioritizing protection over investment, particularly for younger people. So if you go onto the, if you go onto the FOS website, that's quite interesting to see all the cases where, where, where clients are complaining against their advisors and to see which decisions have been upheld and which haven't. It's quite an interesting website because they basically, I saw the other day, there, was, there were two cases. One, there was a lady of 60 saying, look, I was sold a whole lot of life insurance. Why do I need it? And the other guy uh, was also complaining. He was 32 and uh, he had a wife and two kids. And the, and the FOS said, yeah, they could understand why she was complaining because she really didn't need that much protection now. She didn't have children depending on her, etc., etc. There wasn't a protection need to the same extent that there was for the young guy with his two chick kids. And he was complaining that he didn't need protection. And basically the FOS said, well, actually they disagreed. He did. So it's, it's why you are sold the stuff in the first place. You can't come with hindsight. You've got to say at the time, was that a sensible thing to do? And if someone has got two small kids, then it is a sensible thing to do. So you've got to bring that into, into case studies. And obviously, we'll be able to talk a little bit here about RDR, etc., giving suitable advice and giving them advice on how to balance between protection and investment, uh, etc. So you may get wealthy clients, and that means they may own their own businesses. So there's a little bit in the, uh, in the manual on protecting businesses. So we have had some quite high net worth individuals who do run their own companies. And then they're going to be saying things like, um, well, my company is my pension. And you're going to say, yeah, OK. And how secure is your company? So a lot of them have got inflated views on the value of their company. Uh, and certainly they've got a lot of inflated views often of the company without themselves. So you say, OK, so what are we going to do to protect that company? Because it, if it is your pension, it better be protected. What's going to happen if you die and your wife needs or your family needs the money from that business? And it's worth nothing if you're not there. You are the expert. You are the, 
you're the key person, etc. So we'll have to have a look at that, a little bit of financial protection for businesses. And we've got to evaluate the key features, contents and tax treatment of the protection products. Okay, so this is the key difference between, for example, insurance funds and collective investment schemes, etc. So there's lots of questions in the exam comparing those, comparing savings products uh, and investment products in the insurance field as opposed to the um, unit trust, OIC, other forms of collective investment trust field. So we've got to be able to do all of that. We've got to be able to compare those different products. Um, but so it's it's important area. I mean, we mustn't underestimate it. It does obviously come in to, um, to the uh, exams and it's a key part of financial planning. It's just getting those objectives right and getting agreement, obviously, between the two partners that the husband and wife are agreed as to how much is going to go into protection and how much into investment and retirement planning, etc. Okay. So, um, so yes, so remember that it is going to be um, prioritised by the regulator and therefore we've got to be ready for the examiner to ask questions on this in the exam. So, um, we're going to be talking about protection really from insurance products or assurance products. Okay, there's not going to be a lot of uh, debate as to which one is and isn't, but normally we would say that insurance is against something that may happen and assurance is something that will happen. Okay, in other words, we will die. We know that. We just don't know when. But insurance, we don't know. We can insure our house and our car. We might, need, we might not need to claim. So it's all dependent on, on terminology. But to all intents and purposes here, the, the main form of assurance we're going to be looking at is life protection. So the main problem is if you die, but there are equally or even more important, you could say, reasons to protect yourself from illness. Okay, so we'll talk about mourning, critical illness, insurance, etc., etc. Okay, so, so we, will, we will just, we'll just use the words interchangeably, insurance or assurance. Okay, we're not going to make a big deal about it and I'm not going to um, uh, assume that it's not going to be a, a question on its own, it won't be, okay? But the terms are going to be used interchangeably. So in terms of insurance, what we're going to have is we're going to have an insurance company that's going to provide this contract for someone. And then we've got to decide who that someone is. That someone is going to own that policy. In other words, going to own that commitment from the insurance policy company to pay in the event of certain things happening, okay? So we need a proposer for the, um, for, the, um, uh, for the policy. So the proposer is going to be um, the person who is wanting to protect from some event. So they will be proposing to the life insurance company the protection that they want. Okay? Now what we're going to do is that if it is life assurance, we are going to protect a particular life against death. And therefore we need to know who the life assured is. Because what we could have is we can have a policy which protects our lives. So I might want to take a life insurance policy out that pays out to my estate when I die to protect my family. Okay, so that is me as the proposer and the life assured. I might want to take a policy out on my wife uh, because if she dies, I'm going to need someone to look after the children and look after the family and the home, etc., etc. So I want to take out life on another person's life. If I want to take out a policy on some other life assured, okay, so this is not an own life policy, this is life of another, there must be an insurable interest. I can't insure my neighbor. I can't insure David Cameron. Okay, I can only insure someone that I have an insurable interest in. It doesn't mean that they're part of my, my family. It might be my divorced ex-spouse. Okay? They might want to have a policy on my life because I am paying maintenance for the children. So it doesn't have to be an existing spouse, for example, that has that policy. But there must be an insurable interest. And that insurable interest is not, by the way, uniformly defined around the British Isles. There are different interpretations in Scotland uh, as opposed to England. But to all intents and purposes, we need to know, is this going to be a 
single life policy, uh, life of another, is it my life or someone else's life, or are we going to insure a couple? Because if it's then it's a joint life policy, it means then that we might be looking to protect ourselves from inheritance tax or something like that. So we don't want a policy that pays out on the first life, we want it to come out on the second life. Okay, so the joint life policy might be something which we can use as well. Okay? And then we're saying so that the assured is basically the owner of the, of the policy or the beneficiary of the policy. So there's various parts now to this and what the whole idea is is that we are going to insure against events which are um, non-catastrophic. Okay? So the insurance companies are not going to protect themselves from the tsunami in Japan or something like that. Okay? They're not going to go for protecting against Operation uh, Hurricane Katrina or some massive national emergency or national disaster. They won't protect against that. So that's what I often see the government has declared this an, a national disaster or something like that. That means insurance companies are not going to be covered there, not going to be covering there. It's basically gone beyond their remit. So they will have they will want to protect from accidental loss. So they're not going to protect you from not taking medical advice or committing suicide or something like that. Okay, that would not be what they're looking to protect you against. So they're going to be making sure that they have correctly assessed the risk to them. Okay, because what they could be saying is, look, uh, we, need to, um, we need to offer these policies. Who's likely to take the policies? The people who are likely to take the policies are the ones that are most likely to need to use them. So if you think there's a bad history of health, etc., in your family, you'll be more inclined to use the insurance than someone who's from a very fit and healthy family who doesn't have that record. You're not really conscious of that sort of thing. So that's why the insurance companies are going to basically say that there is a, the risk of adverse selection. Adverse selection is basically them being prepared for those who are most likely to need insurance to take it out. And therefore they're most likely to be hiding information, not declaring. And that's why you've seen lots of these cases saying, why isn't this insurance company paying out? Uh, they said, I didn't declare this on my form 10 years ago. I didn't know about the illness, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes a big debate as to whether you could or could not have known about that uh, problem. Uh, and whether you had had some medical advice, etc., on it. The other problem for the insurance companies is what's called moral hazard. Moral hazard for them is basically that people will take out insurance and become less careful as a result. They basically say, oh, well, I'm covered now, so I don't have to be as careful as I should have been before. Okay, so so they've, got to be, they've got to be alert to the, the dangers for themselves of giving too cheap a level of insurance. So we're going to see, particularly with things like annuities, where protection and, and uh, retirement planning overlap, how, how interrelated the health and lifespan and everything else is, and therefore the, it's you betting against the insurance company on your lifespan. Okay, they're going to take a calculated gamble on that. So we've got to now explain the role of insurance in mitigating personal financial risk. And that risk can come from a lot of areas. Okay, so you've got the, the, serious, the serious risk that the main uh, or one of the main money earners uh, has a critical illness, okay, sometimes called a dread disease. So the, the likelihood of them having a dread disease is far higher than them actually dying in the earlier stages of life. So therefore it's a bigger cost to protect yourself against uh, critical illness than it is against death. Okay, because we know that the likelihood is you're going to die in your 70s and 80s, but you could easily have these critical illnesses in your 50s and 60s or even 40s. So this is going to cover us from things like stroke and cancer and heart attacks and things like that. So it may not kill us immediately, we might live on, but it's a serious financial cost because we may not be able to do our job. And therefore we've got to say how well protected are we by the government and by our employer if something like that befalls us. Now early death, okay, so 
We do know the statistics, obviously, on early death. So the insurance companies have got their actuaries. They are looking at life tables. They are seeing what the likelihood of uh, death in the early stages is. Fortunately, we have very good medical cover in the early stages of life. So our, our um, mortality rates for youngsters, for children, is, not, uh, is, is infinitesimal compared to Africa and South America and places like that, where they haven't got the same level of cover for the people in, in, uh, in pregnancy and just after. So early death is uh, obviously a problem, and that's why I say the examiner is going to want to see protection a priority for younger families. Younger families are exposed, parents haven't got up to their peak earning power, maybe you've suddenly gone from two people earning a salary to one person earning and four people living off that salary because you've had two children or whatever it might be. So family protection uh, is going to be uh, very important there. Uh, we could be employed and therefore have a death in service benefit. So death in service is effectively an employer saying we will pay you a multiple of your salary. Now that's going to be very cheap to, uh, to provide because the chances of someone dying, you know, if you look around you at your work and say how many of your colleagues died actually while they were employed by your company? Well, I guarantee you now to be very, very few. If I went through all of you and all your firms, there are very few people that die before retirement. So, so it's not a big risk for the insurance company, particularly if you've got young firms of you know, computer programmers and people like that, and all in their 20s and 30s, the chances of them paying out on death are fairly remote, so they will give you pretty good rates. So that will be a, uh, a benefit which is often provided by the employer, which is not considered for tax purposes. So you know, it's not a taxable benefit. You're going to have that provided, and it's not going to affect your tax position, and therefore most employers will give you, as a matter of course, two times your salary or four times your salary of death cover. But one of the things we're going to have to do in the exam is we're going to have to work out what level of cover we need. And in many cases, four times your salary is going to be woefully inadequate if it is trying to replace what you're going to earn over your lifetime. So we've got to be able to look at that as well. And we've got to calculate how much we think we need in terms of insurance. Therefore, we've got to take a, a view on what they need to be protected from. What are their family circumstances? Are they likely to have parents who could step in and look after the kids if one of them can't, has to go out to work now? Uh, and so on and so forth. Now, a big problem uh, for us in modern society is redundancy. Okay? It's the technology cycle. It's the fact that lots of businesses don't last forever and ever as they did in our grandparents' generation or even our parents' generation. So then we could have expected people in the 50s and 60s to spend their lives working for the great big manufacturing concerns. And now they've basically gone. I was listening to, uh, to a chap on the radio yesterday um, and he was talking about Oldham. And Oldham, I think, in 1909, uh, or 1910 uh, or 11, I can't remember when it was, but Churchill gave his first speech uh, in Oldham as the MP for Oldham. And Oldham was the richest town in the world then. So they were basically saying that at that stage, because of the massive textile industry in the UK, don't forget we'd led the world in there with our spinning jennies and all the rest of it. So we had a massive textile industry and it was centered in Oldham. So there were lots of massively big employers there, whereas now the technology companies that are coming in, they've got like 200 or 300 employees at most, whereas the textile firms had thousands of them. So this is the problem that we're going to have. The chance of redundancy are pretty high now for most people, and therefore insurance companies are not going to want to take that risk on. So it's very difficult to be protected against redundancy, and that's where we've got to be looking at state benefits as well. How will we be protected? if we become redundant. So, so have a look at unemployment protection as well. Inflation, obviously it hasn't been a problem of late, but it looks like it's just raising its head again. So we possibly could think now that inflation will start rising again now that oil is perking up and uh, commodities are probably um, hit the depths uh, and, and likely to be coming up again. So inflation obviously is something we need to be 
thinking about, particularly with annuities, and we'll have a look at the choices between a, a non-inflation linked and an inflation linked to see, and then of course the balance is then, how much do we think we're going to live? Are we, going to, are we a family that's got fairly bad health record? Or are we a fairly long-lived family and therefore going to need protection for a long period of time? Because if we get a long period of inflation, then obviously you've got to have more saved up for retirement than if you think you're only going to live for a few years. So those choices that we get to at retirement become more, more problematic, more based on lifespan, expectancy, etc. Tax, um, we obviously know that governments will come and go, they will change, we might get next government, could be uh, Labour, uh, and, and they may have completely different policies to this government. So you can't rely on whatever this government is paying to continue into the future. They may have a totally different view on the balance between youngsters and older people. So therefore, retirement benefits might be attacked by a different government and so on. So if your government is over indebted, as most governments are at the moment, but ours particularly, we are heavily over indebted by historical standards. We have very high levels of debt. And as those interest rates go up and as that inflation goes up, that burden of that debt is going to start increasing. And that might mean more tax and that means less available for, uh, for, for um, retirement. And then business failure, okay? all those people who are saying, well, my business is my pension and they have got their little shop in the high street and then all of a sudden everyone starts buying on the internet and all of a sudden those shops are a, a, a nightmare. Okay? So they, as they are now for the banks, you've probably seen, they're all trying to close their branches now because they aren't competing uh, with the challenger banks. They're coming in and saying, okay, well, we can do all this online. We don't need all these buildings and uh, air conditioning and heating and lighting and all the rest of it. So that technology change is having a massive impact on business values. So you can get a lot of complacency creeping in there on these business elements. So, so all of these are going to be risks, okay? And all of them are going to influence our consumer attitudes because we're going to basically say, we've got to deal with this high level of uncertainty in all of these areas. So it's not just death. It's inflation, it's, it's taxation, it's redundancy, etc. All of that's got to be dealt with uh, in, our, in our discussion, in our, in our uh, case studies. Mm -hmm.